Okay, well, uh, welcome to a quickly arranged video. Um, around this uh, time of the year, which is uh, winter time or around Christmas time, I, I always get nostalgic for Christmas's past uh, and times past, of course. Uh, and so I thought I want, wanted to talk uh, about some of my most nostalgic memories of uh, one of my favorite years ever, 1990. And that's about EGM magazine. Uh, this is actually the first issue that I ever saw and that I ever bought of EGM. Uh, it's number 14, and I think that's uh, maybe September uh, of 1990. Uh, before then, I had always been, I guess, a, oh, I don't know, Game Pro kid, or I, visit, I uh, borrowed my friend's Nintendo Power magazines. Uh, but I think I, in, even up until early 1990, I really didn't know anything about the greater world of video games, like in Japan uh, or other countries, because uh, I was kind of spoon-fed information from Nintendo, which was you know, pretty bad looking back. Um, so even before buying this magazine, uh, I'd heard from you know, some friends in the know, like, hey, a 16-bit uh, Nintendo is coming. And it's, uh, I was surprised. That, of course, we were all waiting for something like that, because the Genesis had already come out. Um, and the friend said, oh yeah, it's got colorful buttons, uh, it's got four buttons instead of the two, uh, four action buttons, and its name is the Super Famicom. Super, that's what he said, Super Famicom, and I was thinking, no, you're just making that up, shut up, that's just, that's just, the name is just too stupid to even conceive of. Fami, like F-A-M-M-Y, that's like somebody's fanny, what the hell? So I didn't believe it at the time. Um, it just shows how much I, I knew and I didn't know. So, uh, in the summer of 1990, uh, I went on a great, uh, maybe two week holiday with my, my whole family. We drove in our Mazda MPV from Vancouver, Canada, uh, down through Washington, Oregon State, and California, uh, down to Los Angeles and San Diego, and then we drove back up again. Uh, so that was a two-week holiday where we stayed at hotels along the way um, in like Olympia, Washington, and of course Anaheim to go to Disneyland, and then San Diego, uh, and then coming back up to, I think it's Mount Shasta, and then coming back up. So anyway, it was, it was a great holiday. Um, the, we watched MTV at every hotel room, and so the music is really nostalgic from that summer. Um, and we had a lot of fun just playing, goofing around. But of course, you know, as a family, we got into lots of fights. So it was both fun and exhausting. So at the end of that holiday, um, I was, you know, kind of exhausted. And uh, my, my mother and brother and I were going to go on another camping trip soon after. But I was just too emotionally exhausted to, to want to go. So uh, my mom and my brother went and I stayed alone at my grandparents' house downstairs just by myself. So I played a lot of Game Boy. And I played uh, Super Mario Brothers 3 on the Nintendo, I played it on Nintendo, and I read a lot of, uh, I think, video games and computer entertainment magazines, just to pass the time. Uh, so, then uh, when I went to visit my father, uh, he lives on a, an island called Bowen Island, or he lived on an island named Bowen Island back then. Uh, the small general store on that tiny little island had uh, some videos for rent and sometimes Nintendo games, NES games for rent. And they also had this magazine on the rack. Uh, and uh, the price in Canada was $4.95 Canadian. And uh, I thought that was too expensive at the time for a video game magazine, so I didn't buy it. Um, uh, but, you know, like two weeks later, I went to my father's house again, and it was still there. And, you know, just looking at this and seeing, oh my god, it's got Mega Man 3. It's got a preview of Mega Man 3, because uh, I loved Mega Man 2 at the time. Uh, okay, I should just buy this expensive magazine and uh, see what was inside. And yeah, one thing led to another, and uh, so I bought the next one, and my brother bought this one, <laughs> and I bought the next one. Uh, so I have a few old, um, really classic EGM magazines to look through, and probably I don't have enough time, or you guys could just, just get bored if I look through them all in one go. But... Uh, Maybe let's look at these two. These were uh, just eye-openers for me, and this is what I read constantly, again and again, 
throughout fall 1990 and even into wintertime. So that's why my memories of Christmas are really associated with these magazines. On the same island, uh, Bowen Island, uh, every winter it snowed a lot and the power got cut across the island. So we were just trapped inside of a house with no heating, no heating, just a wood stove. And of course, no TV for entertainment. So I think I remember reading this magazine over and over and over again uh, by candlelight. So yeah, you can see, you know, probably anybody would get attached to a magazine like that if they were stuck with it for, you know, three days with no electricity. So anyway, okay. Um, I was just getting into uh, the eighth grade in Canada, which is the first year of junior high school uh, in around Vancouver. Uh, and so I was starting a new school and this was coming out in around September. So I met my old friends and we, we chatted about games or whatever and I met some new friends and they also knew a lot more about video games. So uh, we just uh, talked about the rumors and exciting things that were coming in uh, the end of 1990, what was going on here and in Japan. So this is the first issue I got, EGM number 14. Um, I had never seen a cover of anything about Mega Man 3 uh, before, and so uh, this was just pretty amazing. Uh, I was wondering who, you know, what what robots were going to come, and uh, you know, what what would the game be like? Uh, it turns out, I mean, uh, my opinion is Mega Man 3 is maybe my second favorite Mega Man game. It might be my third favorite after Mega Man 1, believe it or not. But it didn't have the magic and the humor. I think, that uh, Mega Man 2 had. Um, it didn't even have like an intro animation or anything like the Mega Man 2 had, so it was a tiny bit of a letdown compared to Mega Man 2. But I do have great memories of playing Mega Man 3 at my friend's house. Like we rented it over like the winter holidays or Christmas holidays, so uh, my friend and I were, were sitting down in the basement uh, playing Mega Man 3, playing Castlevania 3, watching like Saturday Night Live on TV. So we had a great time, uh, you know, the two or three of us over those holidays. So getting in, well, um, you know, I, I skipped this. It's Tengen, uh, but I had no time for clacks in the 90s and I was not into baseball. I hope you guys can see this okay. All right, so I like the, uh, sorry, this, this magazine's all ripped up, but I, you know, it's old. Um, I liked the design of EGM at this time. It was, I, I guess they moved to like a computer, uh, computer uh, desktop publishing uh, software, but uh, still it hadn't gotten all super colorful or rainbows or 3D uh, highlights and stuff like the later EGMs had. So this is really kind of a quaint uh, snapshot of what EGM looked like at this time. They're just moving over to everything electronic. Um, even back then, I kind of uh, felt uh, EGM was kind of sloppy in their <laughs> editing. They had uh, spelling mistakes and uh, words cut off on a column. Like even back then, I thought it was kind of, you know, so, so, so. I didn't idolize EGM. I thought they could have upped their game a little bit better compared to other magazines. But, you know, when I saw this, like, um, of course, there's new Nintendo NES games coming out, like Mega Man 3, but also they're going to Tokyo for Japanese games. I thought that was awesome. So this is kind of a holdover from their older, more analog days. This clearly looks like a hand-drawn graphic, but scanned, scanned in, so it's kind of faded. Yeah, this one doesn't have the, uh, the date on the issue, but I think the buyer's guide is number 15. And then issue number 16 is November 1990, so you can work backwards from there. So I, I'm going to skip all the letters. You don't need to see them. You don't really need to analyze all those. But people are saying, you know, where's 16-bit Nintendo? Where's 32-bit Genesis? You know, why are, why are you ignoring the TurboGrafx-16? Uh, I think the writing was on the wall there. But, I mean, 1990 was a great year for the Turbo Graphics, probably the best year. They actually brought over lots of, you know, well-needed games. Um, and CD games, too. Uh, Victor Kai has the same, you know, 
uh, had for a few months already. The Goggle 13 and Mafat Conspiracy, Clash at Demon Head. So, yeah, this is really memorable. Uh, EGM really slated uh, Total Recall on the Nintendo because it was a really crappy game. Total Reject. Yeah, just a no fun video game. That's, I think that's what they called it. Uh, here the review crew is just saying, you know, we're, we're playing we're playing Genesis, we're, we had hands-on on Strider. Uh, it's like a Genesis Strider, so that's going to be the best game ever. Uh, they, they, they were kind of lukewarm about Journey to Cilius, but um, looking at the graphics and they, um, they all mentioned the awesome music, so that was a, definitely a sleeper hit, and that's kind of what they would say here. Um, yeah, Cilius is going to be one of those sleeper hits this year. Like, like Batman, the graphics are great, small in scale, but uh, they show large size everything and a jamming soundtrack. So. I've got good memories of going and renting Journey to Cilius also. So, you know, these are kind of drab photographs for Roller Games, Sword and Serpents, and Sega Master System Super Monaco Grand Prix, so I just skipped them all. I, I read, you know, I had lots of free time, of course, so I read all of these reviews, but I didn't really want to buy any of these. Arkista's Ring is a pretty interesting one. It's it's a very similar in gameplay to Roland's Curse, uh, or maybe just overhead action, but this is a much harder game. If you know the graphics turned you off, you should ignore that. Uh, and it's a really cool uh, level by level challenge. Uh, it's like Zelda broken down into little individual uh, challenges, action challenges. Um, columns for the Sega Master System. I always thought that those jewels looked way too tiny compared to the. Uh, arcade or Genesis version. They should have made them double the size. They could have done that, almost. Anyway, um, I was in getting into PC Engine, or and, sorry, Turbo Graphics, even though I didn't have a system at the time. Um, I played it at the local shopping mall, and I was just excited about the games coming out. Psychosis got a good review, and Devil's Crush got a little bit lower scores. Um, however, the music was great. A few of them said that. Devil's Crush is one of the classic games on the Turbo Graphics. Uh, Moonwalker came out, and I didn't have a Genesis, so I didn't care that much, but I thought it was kind of cool. Um, I didn't really want to play it. I just thought, okay, that's cool. Um, Michael Jackson in a video game. The graphics look kind of cool, but I don't feel like playing it just by looking at that. They really hated Budokan. Um, well, uh, I don't think I've ever played it either, so I don't know what to say. Here is Wizard, Wizards and Warriors X, Fortress of Fear, on the Game Boy. And, you know, it's X, so they thought it was Roman numeral 10. And so they're just making jokes about it. Uh, and I kind of like, uh, you know, they're just joking. I missed I missed uh, 3 through 9, but this is a good conversion of the uh, NES game. Uh, I think it's actually a pretty crappy game, but they gave it a pass. I like, you know, Sushi X. You guys probably know Sushi X already. Where is that guy again? Sushi X is kind of considered... Or they're, he's a persona that they're trying to make out to be like some uh, uh, Japanese expert. But he's always the, uh, he's like, uh, he's basically like the Flav of Flav of the review crew. He All he does every review is just joke and uh, uh, goof around. He's the comic relief. And so I like what he did wrote here for Wizards and Warriors 10 or X. Uh, he wrote, a well-made action game for Game Boy. Not as detailed as Chapter 6, not as clever as Chapter 8, not as difficult as Chapter 4, not as colorful as Chapter 9, not as challenging as Chapter 5, but not as expensive as Chapter 21. And I think that's a bankruptcy joke that only Americans would understand. Solstice. I, When I was younger, I just skipped past this, but this is a great game. I mean, um, yeah, one thing I've noticed uh, just by looking at old uh, video game magazines from 89 or 1990 in America is... This, this this artwork is really good, actually. It's not it's not totally typical of ads that I might find later. I might point out later, but uh, U.S. marketing uh, divisions and game companies this was their typical layout. They'd have a logo, they'd have the requisite other logos here, maybe some artwork, often not, and then the tiniest screenshots you would ever see. 
if you were lucky, they would have three screenshots, but usually they have two two photos the size of your thumb. I mean, you can't even appreciate what the game is like or what what it plays like, let alone how good it looks with a tiny thing like this. So uh, US ad quality was like this. It was shit. Um, yeah, I just can't believe it. This is a bit better. I mean, these guys <laughs> knew what was going on. Uh, at least uh, for low G-Man, they showed a picture of the box so you know what to got. No, you knew what to get uh, in the uh, shops. <laughs> and uh, then giant screenshot showing you can jump really high. And some actual captions next to the photos, not just some throwaway pics. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, good games might have sold a bit better if they actually had uh, some uh, more creative ad departments who would do less of this, because they all did this, and more of like this. Hey, look at this. I mean, giant, bold, black text. That's exactly what Sega did with their Sonic the Hedgehog ad campaign. So anyway, um, yeah, on this page, they review Batman for the Game Boy. And yeah, it's got great graphics and... Uh, sound but he's a little bit dinky on screen and he shoots with a gun which is not really batman and then some uh atari lynx reviews um uh, clax got a high score but i was i'm not really into clax so much um uh, yeah xenophobe is cool but uh okay i thought it lacked music but what do i know a lot of link atari lynx games really lack music because they're made by the programmers themselves um is the latest gaming gossip. Super Famicom w went on display, uh, and it did, I think, Nintendo's uh, Shoshinkai show. Um, and Turbo Express is just coming out. So yeah, that was kind of the, the news in the USA. Super Famicom and Turbo Express. Uh, yeah, so more great screenshots by Taxan. And yeah, this, this blew my mind. Uh, uh, Nintendo Power would mention uh, games uh, by name, maybe, or they would have a pr uh, you know a preview, maybe one page of one game uh, with a few pictures. But EGM went all out with tons of uh, screenshots, and I can see here they're using actually screen screen capture software from here, not no, no crappy Polaroids like uh, game players used to use. So Shadow and the Ninja was coming out, uh, and that looked awesome. Ease Book One and Two was coming out, or I thought it would have been out. Uh, so for the P TurboGrafx CD, and that's just an awesome game. So, I mean, month after month at this time, awesome games were coming out. These are all classic games nowadays. Legendary Axe 2, this is one of my favorites, even though the gameplay is frustrating. Uh, it is just an amazing experience, and it's got dark graphics and really dark music, too. So I recommend TurboGrafx Legendary Axe 2. I like it more than the Legendary Axe 1. Uh, Bravo Man, um, this looked interesting, but yeah, the next couple issues they said this is crap, and it is so-so. Uh, Dragon's Curse, it has tiny pictures here, but they should have previewed this a bit more. Tiger Road, I never liked it. I played it at the uh, at the local Radio Shack on their kiosk, and I didn't like it, just from one playthrough. Alright, so SNK announces their uh, Neo Geo AES, the, the home system. And I really was blown away by this too. A home system that could do graphics uh, like this. Magician Lord looked amazing. Golf, eh. Top player, I mean, Baseball Stars Professional looks all right. Cyber Lip, Lip just looked amazing. Uh, as well as Ninja Combat. Riding Hero looked really cool, but it sucks. Uh, and Nam 75 was really awesome. So I just, sorry, I just uh, bumped, <laughs> bumped my camera there. I just really like uh, always poured over these tiny little screenshots and extracting as much information as I possibly could. So here's some cheats for Ghouls and Ghosts, etc. I'll skip it. Tecmo World Wrestling. Although it's a good game, where are the screenshots? Do you guys know how to make ads? All right, Battle Chess is kind of cool. Again, um, yeah, this is more typical uh, software company ad style they have like some kind of bold statement which is kind of cool you know the old chess game is made for change for the better knight obliterates rook but then they still have these tiny little pictures showing what's going on and i think battle chess's claim to fame was having awesome graphics for every 
an animation for every uh, step that your pieces took, so they should have highlighted that. I mean, that's that was kind of the selling point of this game. Fuck, I could have done a better job. Jesus. Uh, Phantom Fighter, same thing. I mean, cool art. It's it's the same as the box, I think. But I think even kids' eyes are gonna go bad looking at this tiny little screenshot. And my pinky finger. Christ. All right, moving on. All right, Castlevania Three had already been out a little bit, but uh, I think it was kind of hard to get or hard to find in Canada. Oh yeah, another thing around this time in Canada. You would see all these great games coming out, but um, and they probably came out in the United States at the time they were announced. But if you went to uh, an electronic store or a game game shop or the usual department store to find these games, they had not arrived yet. So I think Canada's distribution system for Nintendo games was lagging a little bit behind the USA's at this time. I think it caught up in the 1990s, but still, uh, you know, we try to find these and then. You know, finally one kid would get uh, Castlevania 3 right before Christmas. So that was kind of a frustrating thing. All right. Uh, here we go on to something that really blew my mind, uh, the Tokyo Toy Show uh, in 1990. And I tried to find, you know, uh, video footage of this online uh, for, you know, uh, on Nico Nico Doga or YouTube, but I could not find anything for the 1990 Tokyo Toy Show. There was one for like the next year or the following couple years. Uh, on the internet. You, you can actually watch the toy show, but not this one. I would have loved to have seen some video from this one. Okay, so the Tokyo Toy Show uh, was maybe one of the biggest electronic events in Japan. This is where game companies showed their latest games. Um, and in the middle of 1990, I think this was like August... Uh, when was it? Oh no, it was June! Sorry, my mistake. Uh, June 1990. Uh, but still, it came out in the September issue of EGM. Uh, at this time, uh, they're going to show the game products that are going to come out in the fall and, and winter. Uh, and everybody's waiting for the Super Famicom to come out. But Nintendo was a no-show at this this toy show. They had their own Shoshinkai uh, a little bit earlier, I think. So EGM covered all the games that uh, third parties and other producers are making, but nothing by Nintendo themselves. Uh, yeah, Nintendo's showing will be in this issue, so soon enough. So I, I loved looking at these photos. Uh, I mean, everything's... I, I gotta say, I'm just nostalgic for this layout. They took photos, they took tons of photos, and then they uh, put them in these just cute uh, rounded rectangle frames. Which looks amateurish, but I think it's quaint. Um, and I like, they could have made them bigger, but I like just looking at all these photos that are non-game related. Like, this is the uh, the big egg uh, at Makuhare Messe in Tokyo, or in Chiba, actually. Uh, and uh, that's the entrance for the toy show. And just, uh, um, the Messe is just, a, it's just a giant, like a gi giant convention center. Uh, with high roof, a high roof, and you know, game uh, company logos uh, way up in the rafters. Uh, and this is just a street shot of some alleyway in Japan. They're saying this is Sushi X. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Batman for the Mega Drive uh, was shown here, and people were they were saying, yeah, this is great, but it's never coming out here. Um, I think EGM took lots of photos, uh, and then. But they didn't have a, a skilled translator uh, on their staff, so they're just guessing at the names or using, you know, uh, second or third hand information to what this game's name is. They're calling this Twin Hawk. Uh, this is Daisenpu on the Mega Drive. All right. Uh, Advanced Daisenpu, but they called it Super Invasion 2. I think they're just making these names up. Uh, here's Sonic the Hedgehog. All right, so and really old uh, layout, but I think this was shown uh, earlier at a different show, maybe. But anyway, yeah, so Alex Kidd is, is on his way out as Sonic's, as Sega's mascot, because here's Sonic. That's very true. Uh, and you can buy batteries and, well, soda, of course, beer also, at these vending machines. It's pretty awesome. All right, Battle Golf for Yui. Um, 
I always thought this was like some weird guy's helmet, but actually it's it's a girl upside down on a bed with some kind of machine sucking out her life energy. Space Invaders 90 is, is a good game, but they said 16-bit Space Invaders? Talk about overkill. Space Invaders on the Game Boy was bad enough, but on a 16-bit machine? Uh, so they didn't think that was a good idea. I think they don't even know, like, uh, Taito's Majestic 12 in the arcade. I think that's what this is a conversion of. Uh, isn't just a Mahjong game. This is a Gambura uh, Jiko Chushinha. Uh, anyway, it's a Mahjong game that's been out on many systems, but they call it a block-turning puzzle. A puzzle game. They should just say it's Mahjong. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Um, Sayo Blade is kind of cool. Just a, a graphic adventure game. Bonanza Brothers. Oh, Rastan Saga 2. Um, I played this I played this game a lot, or I watched uh, people play this game a lot at the uh, uh, corner store near my junior high school. So this game is really etched into my memory. It is a shitty game, but, you know, it's it's a quarter muncher. Anyway, it's coming out of the Mega Drive. Here they're showing Japanese money with, and the, uh, you know, how would you like to have money with holes in them? So the 5 yen and 50 yen coins have a hole in the center. Super Airwolf and Philios. Here's Dando, uh, which also would have been called Vasum. Uh, and this was never released on the Mega Drive or, or any system. Um, it is sort of a conversion of uh, Legendary Axe 1 and also uh, Astian Axe because uh, it's by the same designer. Uh, so it's very similar to, I mean, in appearance, of course, to Legendary Axe, uh, except with more adventure elements. I really wish this would have come out. Uh, QT Suzuki and Ringside Angel, so a girls wrestling game. Uh, Final Zone Axis. It's kind of cool looking. Burning Force and just some views of Taito's arcades in Japan. Another game, uh, game maniad. They really love to push Acclaim and FCI. <laughs> And probably also Bandai games. I'm sure they had a special dealing with the deal going on with them. So here's NEC of Japan. So unlike uh, NEC of America or the Turbo Graphics, NEC of Japan is a major company. And here they're showing all the games. And uh, I just looked at these and I thought, well, these are all just weird looking. Uh, first of all, they're weird, and second, they're amazing because some of them are recognizable. So for example, here's Ghouls and Ghosts for the Super Graphics, uh, Dai Makaimura. And just uh, the arcade quality screens uh, were really amazing because I had known the uh, uh, Genesis version, of course. Uh, Darius 2, I don't think I knew this game at the time. Valus 3, I've heard of Valus 2, maybe. And, you know, what's this all about? Well, it looks like a romance or adventure game. Um, yeah, I think this name is Fairy Dust Story, but this is uh, Make You No Elfine, uh, a really lightweight uh, RPG or adventure, action adventure game on the PC Engine. Um, pretty much you go over and, uh, I mean, I didn't know about it now, but they call it Fairy Dust Story, and it's never going to come out over here. Uh, it's true. You have to exp explore a few different worlds. Some of them, like this one, is like Lego themed. The whole area is built out of Lego. You know, other ones are like just standard grassy plains and so on. You just have to go around talking to people doing some fetch quest, and then playing some mini games. So the mini games are kind of cool. There's a shooting game, a cutesy shooting game, like a Pong uh, or Breakout style game. Uh, well, I forget what other types, but uh, it's uh, it, you can buy it for cheap now, and it's kind of cool just for the mini games. Uh, but yeah, it's another you know, cruddy, uh, cutesy adventure game for the PC Engine. And also it has a an idol. I forgot to mention that. It's Starring an idol mean, uh, named, uh, what's her name? Tomomi something or other. Her nickname is uh, Tomoroz. So she's shoved into this game. So around this time, a lot of PC Engine adventure games had some uh, teenage idol or, you know, aging idol shoved into a game with a couple of her pop songs at the beginning and the end of the game uh, and a music video to go along with it. And the contents itself is pretty shitty. Oh man, yeah. So it looked cool, and it's I like the graphics, but I shouldn't be spending so much time with such a shitty game. Last Armageddon is interesting. Half man, half beast enemies. There's Mr. Donut and McDonald's menu, and where else could you get a McShrimp burger? Die Hard for the PC Engine. Now that's interesting. Uh, another overhead racing game. 
here's one. It says, I mean, the obvious, EGM obviously looked at the pictures and didn't know even, didn't know, couldn't comprehend what this game was. So they say, one new use for the CD player is to store digital photos. This game demonstrates the data storage capabilities of a CD. In this CD, you see various digitized pictures of a typical day at a high school. And actually, that's not what it's about. This game is uh, Mitsubachi Gakuen, or uh, Honey Bee Academy. And it is a uh, an idle training simulator where you have a whole bunch of... Uh, well, you have four different years, spring, summer... Or four different seasons, I mean. Spring, summer, fall, winter uh, terms in this academy. And you have to train a class of young girls, ages you know, 12 to 16, to become music idols and yeah it's not for me i don't uh i haven't played this game very much but uh it does have a lot of digitized graphics and uh, nec at the time or hudson at the time had a uh, idol contest in 1989 1990 to recruit girls for this game and so uh, they got 12 to 16 year old girls to come and audition for uh, a a spot in this game and to become an idol themselves and they would come out in you know cute dresses but also they had a swimsuit competition and why are you putting 12 and 6 to 16 year old girls in a swimsuit competition uh japan so yeah uh in other in some other pc engine magazines you can see the actual auditioning process for this game yeah it's uh i think young people call it skeevy nowadays right um when you if you play this game the opening uh, video, or not a video, the opening still dialogue uh, is uh, the, the head teacher at the school welcoming you as a new teacher to this academy and uh, suddenly a phone call comes up and one of the girls uh, in the academy had gotten pregnant uh, and <laughs> then he had to deal with that and so he looked to you as the teacher again and said yeah these are the kind of things you have to deal with as a uh, trainer or manager for uh, a bunch of young girls so Who is this game for? Uh, who is attracted to 12 to 16 year old girls wearing swimsuits and possibly getting pregnant? I'm going to leave this one well enough alone. So maybe it was a good idea for EGM just to call it a you know, digital photo database. Uh, Double Ring is a cool game. Um, it's got W because in Japan uh, they can't distinguish between W and double, the word. Uh, and so uh, the letter W is a substitute for the meaning of something doubled up. So, uh, yeah. Well, I think in this game you have to go through it each level twice or more, so that's probably the, the concept for Double Ring. Gomola Speed looked interesting, at least the title screen did, and that's kind of cool. It's a new version of Centipede. No, it's not. They got it wrong. You are the worm or the centipede in this game. You don't destroy the multi-segmented bug before it gets to the bottom of the screen. Um... I think EGM was just looking at photos back in their uh, Illinois <laughs> uh, offices and figuring out from the screenshots what was the game's name and concept. Uh, here's a Zelda-like quest. This is a uh, Momotaro Densetsu Turbo, a, a conversion of the uh, Famicom game. And it's just a bog-standard, funny, comical RPG. Uh, Xevious. Uh, here's Vague's tactical gladiator but the japanese title screen just has vagues with really tiny text there okay all right so one of the best shooters of, this, of the show was superstar soldier and that's very true that's a great game uh it since 1990 we've been, we've been playing this one over and over and over so maybe it feels kind of stale but if you have this game, you should play it again and just try to go all the way to the ending. It is, it gets hardcore near the end, and I sometimes like it more than Soldier Blade. Operation Wolf is kind of cool. Uh, what's this? Baseball on CD? Uh, well, again, the title screen is pretty awesome looking, um, just with weird angled colored uh, out of this world Japanese text. Uh, and that was kind of what I liked about reading this uh, magazine. Uh, Batman was a disappointment when compared to the Mega Drive version. Uh, yep, moving the Cape Crusader around walled corridors like a rat in a maze just doesn't represent the Batman character, they thought. And yeah, it's kind of true. Splendid Saga. This didn't come out. This was first named Splendor, and then it was named Splendid Saga. 
And I don't know what kind of game it is. It says Zelda type. It could have been just a straight RPG. But since it was never released, we don't know. Again, here's Daisenpu on the uh, PC Engine. Okay, here's Ultra Box, which is really not a video game. It is just a um, quarterly uh, game magazine. It's a, it's a video magazine where they have uh, reader letter and postcard submissions, art submissions. They have news. They have a couple mini games where you like date a girl or press a button rapidly to undress a girl, that sort of thing. So it's just a weird multimedia effort. However, EGM uh, called, well, I don't think they're calling it a uh, video game, but here it says the characters are huge and sometimes fill the whole, and some fill the whole screen. Well, it's just a still piece of art. So yeah, they're not enemies. Uh, others combine what appears to be a normal body with an unreal alien type head. Uh, yeah, it's not a video game. They're just looking at the screenshots and guessing what it's about. Here's Power League 3. Um, this is a Famicom game here, so it should be somewhere else. Here's Technos of Japan's offices, where the game programmers are. Okay, moving on to uh, Famicom or Game Boy. Okay, so notably absent from the toy show was Nintendo. The third party licensees were all here, but they were Nintendo was prepared for the Famicom. So here's a whole page of uh, black and white Game Boy games. Um, Afterburst is really cool. It never came out in North America, but I like it a lot, even though it's really simplistic and blocky. Uh, you know, Pocket Stadium, just a baseball, pro wrestling, I'll skip it. Um, yeah, this is J Oira Jajamaru on the Game Boy, which is uh, it's pretty crappy and bizarre and overly ambitious at the same time. Game Boy games have sunk to a new low. Rather than push technology to its limits, the games are now reverting back to the Atari 2600 days 13 years ago. Run over all the dots on the screen while avoiding the opposing car. Wow! Yeah, this was head-on on the uh, Game Boy. It really is primitive. Solomon's Club on the Game Boy is pretty cool. And I just looked, looking at the uh, art and the graphics. I think this whole thing was removed in the US version. So, nice artwork. Yeah, and Gremlins 2. Easily the best Game Boy card at the show. I kind of disagree. Uh, I don't like Gremlins 2 on the Game Boy. Uh, it is frustrating and annoying. Here's Bomber Boy and Twin B Da. They should have shown pictures of that, but they didn't. And then uh, it's an F1 Spirit, F1 racing game, I think. And then more uh, street view shots of uh, Japan. All right, so Insector X on the Famicom. Uh, I think this is a pretty faithful conversion of the uh, uh, arcade game, as, faith as faithful as they, as they can get. Uh, another Downtown Nikitsu game, uh, Captain Tsubasa 2. Two? Yeah, Captain Tsubasa 2. This is volume 2 there. Another Game Boy Ghostbusters 2. That's a good game. Hiryu no Ken 3. Great graphics. I thought I was looking at that thinking, wow, that's a pretty awesome game. But again, it's not really my style of game anyway. Heracles no Eiko 2. And I think that was an older game, there, but Data East is showing it again. SDF by Hal. Uh, I'm not sure what this one is. I'll have to skip it. Side pocket on, and on the Game Boy, and then a, a pamphlet for the Game Gear. All right, and here is uh, Dracula Kun on the Famicom, another great game. And they're saying it's an Alex Kidd type adventure game. So yeah, okay, that's what they're they're, they're calling it. Another Niketsu game, this time it's soccer. Uh, Moedo Pro 90, uh, bases loaded. Yeah, so. Jaleco could be planning a Bases Loaded 3, this one, for next year. And I think it's true. Uh, Ozumo Warriors. Here we go. Finally, I looked at this. Okay, it's it's a tiny screenshot, but I drooled over that. So before this, I didn't know that uh, Mega, Mega Man was actually named Rockman. So yeah, I was a naive kid. Um, over here, he's known as Mega Man, but in Japan, our hero is known as Rockman. This game, the third in the series, is exactly the same as what we will see this winter. So uh, I was just wondering, okay, it's going to be the same as Mega Man, but oh man, I wanted to, I wanted this game on my Nintendo. So in the fall of 1990, I phoned up uh, a mail order game company and said, hey, I want to get Rockman 3 on the Famicom, please. And he said, well, uh, soon you're, we have Mega Man 3, do you want that? And I said, no, 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 I want to get Rockman, I want the Japanese version. 
Uh, and he said, it's exactly the same game. Why would you want a Japanese version of a game? Uh, so that guy on the phone convinced me not to buy Rockman 3 and instead mail order Mega Man 3. And I had to wait for that to arrive. Jesus. Yeah, I was a dumb kid, but I'm getting off the point. Uh, this was the reason why I bought the magazine, just to see some screenshots of Mega Man or Rockman 3. Here's an odd game from Sunsoft. An odd. Usually Sunsoft makes good games, but this is an odd bad one. Pre Pre, Primi Primitive Princess. And by the way, Pre Pre is also a pun. Uh, in Japanese, people read Puri Pre, uh, Puri Puri, uh, meaning uh, jiggly. So Pretty Pretty is an adjective meaning a jiggly girl who wiggles and jiggles in all the right places. So, yeah. That's Japan. Okay, here's Parodius for the Famicom. Uh, and uh, another Saburo Jinguji game. And then just screenshots, or sorry, not screenshots, snapshots of Tokyo. All right, I think that's the end of the uh, international section. And uh, these... Pages right in the middle. I just looked over them over and over again. That's why the staples popped out. They popped out of the staples because I was just so amazed at all these weird and cool-looking Japanese games. Again, this is the first preview I saw of Mega Man Three, uh, and yeah, this is the U.S. version that previewing because the it says Mega Man back here. I think there is a uh, prototype version of this game uh, uh, dumped and leaked online because in this screenshot. Here, uh, the top corner of Mega Man's uh, helmet is, even though he's got the top spin, uh, where he's turned uh, mustard, mustard uh, yellow and brown, the top corner of his helmet is still blue. So that's a little bug that's you can see in a prototype version. So yeah, I, li I liked this uh, company. Uh, SCI for, well, EGM did the layout, as you can tell, because the fonts are exactly the same uh, for SCI, but they had just more pictures of cool things. What's a super graphic? I didn't know what that was. It blew my mind. How much is it? Only $300? Uh, yeah. Ghouls and Ghosts was 100 bucks back then. And I guess, you know, if you had a job... Uh, Splashing down $400 plus shipping for Super Graphics might have been worth it, uh, you know, if that's what you really wanted. Although the Super Famicom is coming soon for also for $300. Due in late November. Yep, November 21st to be precise. All right, here's game ground for the Master System. I didn't know what this game was and it was for the Master System, so I kind of ignored it. But it is a good game on every system. You've seen this before, right? Genesis does. What Nintendo don't. So this was their uh, controversial ad campaign, but it was kind of cool. I I, um, I had a friend who had a Genesis, and uh, my brother once in a while would borrow a Genesis from somebody, so we could play a couple of these games. So I thought the Genesis was really cool, as long as you didn't get all the sports games for it. So here's what's coming out soon, what's new on the Genesis. Strider is new, uh, Sword of Vermilion, Dynamite Duke, Columns, Moonwalker. So pretty exciting. Dick Tracy, Spider-Man, and WrestleWare were all coming soon. Not this one. So moving on to the latter half of the magazine, we have uh, the Master System preview. and. I think I'd seen pictures of Super Monaco Grand Prix on the Game Gear, and this one looked a bit downgraded compared to that, so I was not impressed. But, oh, Psychosis for the Turbo Graphics. Now here's just a weird and awesome game. Nowadays I like it a bit less than I used to back then, uh, just because it's a bit frustrating and random and also glitchy, but, uh, but still, it's a cool game to try out. So definitely try to get Psychosis or Paranoia on the PC Engine. Oh wow, Thunder Force 3. Um, this page is a little bit too busy. I mean, I think it, it's a little bit of a turnoff having all, all black and, the, and all black screenshots too. So it kind of hides the fact that it's a great uh, 
intense shooting game uh, with amazing graphics. But I think you know enough about the Thunder Force series, so I won't dwell on that. Uh, Whip Rush. Um, I don't think I've played this one. I, I just remember remarking about the ship looks a little bit uh, snub-nosed, like some kind of uh, pug bulldog, so I thought that was kind of weird looking. I think this was published by um, Sega, but developed by Vic Tokai. Uh, and here are some kind of old screenshots of Atari Lynx games. I think some of these... Okay, no, no, my mistake. It's a Rampage, okay. So yeah, just a big Atari uh, Lynx spread. The Atari Lynx was kind of cool, but uh, I remember it was hard to find in Canada. And uh, I saw it in Seattle when I was shopping there one time. And it's cool, but it was just too damn big. <laughs> you idiots, Atari. It was too damn big. You could have made it much smaller. Uh, anyway. Yeah, lots of mail order ads in here. Uh, just of varying sizes. I'm warning you, it's bad. Never mind the turtles, it's so bad. I love the power glove. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's super glove ball ad for the power glove with no fucking screenshots. You idiots. Ah. Mattel, is that how you advertise for stuff? Idiots. God, these ad agencies, they don't even know how to sell games. A 13-year-old could have done a better job. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the Game Boy. Um, EGM was using, obviously, they are obviously using a wide boy type system to digitize uh, live video from the Game Boy uh, through the Famicom. Um, but, you know, it's nice and clear and good graphics uh, for the inter interstitial scenes on the Game Boy game. So, yeah, awesome. I should have bought a Turtles game back then, but I, I don't think I did. What was I doing back then? I was playing uh, Nemesis and Quirk on the Game Boy a lot. Also Super Mario Land and Tetris. Uh, this is kind of nostalgic too. They have their screenplay, uh, just what's on what, what movies, comic books are coming out. This is Predator 2. Um, this was really exciting. Uh, Star Trek Next Generation had a uh, cliffhanger episode uh, between the 1989-90 seasons and 1990-91 seasons where... Uh, Picard was captured by the Borg and got transformed into Locutus. Uh, that was a really awesome episode. And here EGM is just saying, you know, uh, it started out really rocky. Uh, this The series uh, started out really rocky, but Next Generation has gotten much better and really recently. So we, we just can't wait to... I can wait. Okay. All right, guys. You and your spelling mistakes. They just can't wait to see what's going to come up next. So yeah, an exciting time. Here's Ultimate Game Club. Uh, if I remember, uh, these guys got just so many complaints by uh, angry, uh, spurned uh, consumers that they got shut down or banned out of certain magazines. So they just had too many complaints of poor business. Um, yeah, High Score Club. And finally, Game Over. So they... EGM showed the ending to a video game uh, at the back of their, their issues. And if I remember, the uh, game over for one week, uh, month was the uh, top score uh, contender for the next month or something like that. So here they showed the ending to Bonk's Adventure. All right, and an ad for Kick Looky Bickle. And I think Irem... They, they certainly got the back cover of EGMs a lot, right? They really were pushing Kickle Cubicle, weren't they? Um, not my favorite game. I, I think um, it's cool and it's cute, but um, I think definitely back then when I was a you know 13-year-old boy, I would not be interested in a guy in blue tights. Like a game like this, an image fight on the back. All right. So uh, that is one read-through, a little bit of a read-through of EGM. Um, I think I spent more time just talking about my memories and uh, uh, 
uh, some cool recommended games than I did most of the stuff in this issue. Um, if you don't like that, uh, then you know, please tell me you don't like it. Uh, but yeah, this is, was my first EGM issue. It's of course my favorite. Uh, seeing all those Japanese games with their weird title screens was uh, just wonderful for me. It, it, that was a time that expanded my universe and my perspective on video games. Uh, and that was what started drawing me towards Japan, which is where I live now. So definitely thank you, EGM number 14, from September 1990. Uh, a great time in my life, uh, and I hope it was a great time in yours uh, or your parents, if you're too young. So I'm going to move on to another issue. 